and ladies. So I work this out in my mind. I have my clicker, my little fancy clicker that clicks things. I turn that on too. And I have my Bible and the iPad in two hands. I have hard enough time walking and talking at the same time, believe it or not. So I decided I'm probably ready to use this podium so I don't drop things and make things more awkward than I already do naturally. Good morning. I'm thankful for the Lord's Supper, an opportunity for us to remember his goodness and the sacrifice that he made for our salvation. And the salvation wasn't just because he wanted to say, you're bad and I'm good, be like me. His salvation, his deliverance was, I want to spend the rest of eternity with you because I love you. I created you for more than hell. And uh, he gave us away. And I'm grateful for that. So let's you and I pray together. The Father in heaven, we, we are thankful this morning again for this time we gather together to celebrate you and your goodness, to celebrate your availability to all who call upon your name. That your word is true and, and, in your, and your faithfulness is most faithful. We're grateful for that today. This morning as we study, Father, I ask that you even now begin to open up the minds of this man here and of my family, my brothers and my sisters in Christ and those who are listening on the internet, uh, uh, that uh, you begin to open up our minds to the reality of the, and the power of your love for us and the, and the mission and the method that you've called for us to reach others with the good news of your love. So engage our minds, empower our hearts, and equip our spirits to, to do the things you've called for us to do. We give you this time. Please, Jesus, just reign supreme in this room. I'm thinking for your presence here. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right. I, I, I like language. We're, we're, we're continuing our study of Matthew and, uh, from the perspective of, of a disciple. Specifically, we're looking at the Beatitudes. And today, we're talking about Jesus calling us to be salt and light. And that we, you and I, are to be transformational, impactive, impactual. We should make an impact in the places that we go and the, and the spaces that we spend time in. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. We'll get to that here in just a moment. I got double click. Look at that. So I, I love language. And language gets me in trouble. Today, today we're talking about words and what words mean. And... Um, when I was a young man, I, I worked in a prison. When I was 18 years old, I worked in a prison, and I worked there for 10 years. It was in Texas, so there was a, 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 a Texas has a lot of Spanish-speaking people that live there, and I was working alongside people whose primary language was Spanish. It was really great, but I learned words um, that I didn't quite know what they meant, but I understood the context. When something happened, you said this particular thing, or that bad thing happened, you said this particular thing. And I did, but I didn't know what exactly that I was saying. So fast forward about 14 years, and I've submitted to the, to the ministry to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I, I left my little town of Angleton, Texas. I moved to Fort Worth to attend Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. It's a pretty eminent school in Southern Baptist life. And, and I was there and, and, and had a job. I was a bellman in a hotel. And I loved that job. It was that servant Jones in me was just fed really well. And I worked side by side with a brother of mine. Uh, his name was Arturo Calderon. You can tell by his name, he was, he was a Spanish-speaking man. And uh, we worked on the same ship, went to the same school. We lived in the same building together. And, and so we were working together one night. The New York Yankees had come to stay at our hotel. And in typical Yankee fashion, they mess everything up. If you're a Yankee fan, I just offended you, and I'm glad I did. <laughs> They got there really, really late. They're way like an hour and a half late. The weather was terrible. It's 1.30 in the morning. They're just now checking into the hotel. And my job, me and Arturo's job, was to get their bags in their rooms before they got in their room. So it was, and everything was all messed up. And I mumbled something under my breath in Spanish. I'm not going to repeat it here, because now I know better. And my friend Arturo just looked at me, and I saw him looking at me, but we're busy. I didn't think anything of it. We're working away, and, 
something, and I said another thing, another phrase in Spanish, and, and he said, Skip, your mama, my brother, do you know what you're saying? And I said, yeah, I just repeated it to him. And he said, do you know what it means? And I thought about it. No, I don't really know what it means at all. And then he told me. And then I had to repent there and there. Just there in that same space. I was ashamed. It was ungodly. It was ugly. It was not in my character to speak like that. And, and my point is this, is that slang words affect us. We have to be very careful about what we say. 50% of Americans admit to using slang without knowing what it means. That's not smart if you're one of those people. And, and you could also be like me. Well, don't be like me, actually. You could do better than me. Is that you use words like 10 years after anybody is saying them anymore. And you, you finally figure out what they mean, you begin to use them, and people look at you like, nobody says that anymore. That's me too. I, I shouldn't do that. 50% of Americans admit to using slang without knowing what it means. 20% of Americans say they use slang in every conversation. That's pretty incredible. 50% of Americans say they use slang without knowing what it means. The most well-known slang in America, America are ghosted. You kind of just, just disengage from somebody on the social media. Just don't talk to them anymore. Or salty. Uh, someone who's being salty is being bitter or angry or kind of, uh, the kids are looking at me like, you're a moron, Skip, you need to stop. <laughs> and uh, so kind of bitter and angry, you're feeling salty, and, and the, the other most uh, uh, well-known thing is on point, which I do use regularly and uh, probably too much, and I know the context, so I'm good there. 58% of Americans don't know what Rona means. Y'all know what Rona means? No. Oh. It's okay, see, it's, it's a high percentage, you're right there. The Rona is having the Rona, Corona, the Rona, Rona. Okay, we're gonna keep moving. 58% of Americans don't know what Rona means. 66% of Americans are annoyed by slang compared to 46% of those without children. So those without children are less annoyed by slang than those with children. You do the math. That's from preplied.com. I, I wore this shirt today for two reasons. Number one, it matches my wife's shirt. And I, I like to match with her when we dress out together. And this is also from my, um, my son's wedding. His colors in his wedding was orange and black. Um, he's Gen Z, go figure, that's okay. And it was a great wedding, we had a good time. I had a black sports jacket on and a black tie, and uh, it was in California, in Simi Valley. And I walked into the wedding venue, the backyard of a, of a neighbor's house. It's California, you can do those things, because the weather's almost always great. And I walked in, and my daughter-in-law, who may be one of the most hippest, coolest kids I've ever met in my whole life. Her name is Sydney, and I love her to death. She's really wonderful, and she looked at me, and of course, she's, she's the bride, she's the wedding, she's happy, she's excited, and she said, Skip, the drip is tight, is what she said. <laughs> and I looked at her, and I said, what? And she, and then she explained it to me, and I spent the next six months talking about my drip. All the time, it became annoying, but Tina Marie asked me to stop doing it, and I did because of that. Uh, so so I, I'm also annoyed by me using slang, and some of my friends are as well. Slang is important. When, when Jesus uses the term to be salt, he wasn't, refer, he wasn't encouraging us to be bitter. He wasn't encouraging us to be angry. He wasn't encouraging Christians to be salty. He is saying, when he told us to be salt, he's saying, be present, be influential, and be impactful. That's what salt does. Salt is present, influential, and impactful on the things that it touches, and you and I should be the same. Let's look at this passage together. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Important, I want you to point this out. It's kind of unpack this in my own mind, studying for this message. It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? 
I was always confused by the it. I didn't understand the pronoun. My mind, in the way that the sentence laid out, and it's probably because I'm not an English major, I wanted to connect the it back to the salt, but the connection is back to the earth. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall the earth be seasoned? How shall our culture, how shall our environment, the places that we work in, that we live in, how shall it be seasoned with salt if you and I are not salty anymore? So last week, we talked about how we operate in God's economy, and it's where we experience uh, abundant living. By operating in the kingdom economy, we can understand that by reforming our thinking, our operating system, that we will shine before men and that they may see our good works, good works and glorify the Father. I want to go back and revisit the Beatitudes that we're studying. This is found in Matthew 5, uh, beginning in verse 3. You know these passages probably fairly well, so you can probably follow along in your own mind and heart. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We unpacked all those passages last week, and if you want to go back and review that sermon, you can find it on our YouTube channel. Please like, subscribe, and share. Jack Hayford said this. He said this. He said, the Beatitudes describe the essential character of kingdom citizens. How many of you know, if you know that if you're born again, you are a citizen of heaven? This world is not your own. Your citizenship is where your king is, and your king is in heaven. The Beatitudes that I just read describe the essential character of kingdom citizens and the metaphors of salt and light indicate the citizens' influence for good as they penetrate secular society. Pastor Jack is saying that we as kingdom citizens have penetrating influence over secular society. Penetrating influence over secular society. You have an influence in the spaces that your feet fill. Amen. Everywhere you go, everything you do, every conversation that you have is an opportunity for you to influence your culture for the good of the kingdom. And you might be saying to yourself, well, Skip, I, I don't speak a lot. I, I can't talk. I'm not very, I don't know the Bible very well. I feel like I'm not smart enough to have these conversations with people. They might ask me scary questions. You are filled with the Holy Ghost. When the Holy Ghost entered you, it influenced you, and it changed your trajectory. Wherever you go, the, ghost, the Holy Ghost goes with you. And wherever you go, and the people you engage with in love, the Holy Ghost engages with you in love. You are an influence, whether you like it or not. The question is, what kind of an influence are you? When you and I... When you and I uh, uh, What's the word that, that Jack used? Um, we have penetrating influence. That was my words. I think about, you ever try to take a wheel off of a car or a truck that's been on for a while, and the nuts, the, the love nuts are rusty, and they're all rounded off, and they're all terrible, and you just can't, and you try to twist them off, and you can't get them off. What do you do? You get out the WD-40, and you spray it down real good. The WD-40 fixes everything. I had, a, I, had a, I had a cut one time in my arm, put WD-40 on. I lied. I didn't do that. That's not true. That's, I had a bad rash, so WD-40 took care of it right away. You put the WD-40 on it and let it sit. That oil penetrates inside, the, inside, behind the nut and the bolt, around the threads. And I don't know how it works. I'm not a smart guy, but I know it begins to loosen up the things that is keeping that that, that thread tight, it penetrates into it and it makes a difference in the space where it's at. And you and I are the exact same way. It's a, it's a magical thing. You take, and you take the, the four way and you just go, whoo, and you get it right off. It works out really, really well. Or if you're not smart like I have been in the past, you, you're working on something and you have an impact wrench handy, instead of taking the time to use the, the PB blaster or the WD-40 to loosen up the nuts, I grab up the, the three quarter inch impact wrench and twist it every lug bolt off. 
See, that wasn't smart. That wasn't how you do that kind of stuff. But you and I have an opportunity to be an influence for good as we penetrate secular society. So how does salt influence? He said, he said you are the salt of the, of the world. How does salt influence? Well, number one, salt is a preservative. In the olden days, before they had refrigeration, they would use salt to preserve meat. It would give it longer shelf life, and, and you don't have to eat it right away. You can wait three or four days, or I don't know how long salt lasted when you salted meat. You've had beef jerky. Guess what? That's salted meat. That's all that it is, and it lasts forever, um, seemingly forever. And it, so it's a preservative. Things that are decaying, it, 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 it keeps it from decaying. How many of you know that our culture is decaying? I mean, how many of you know that the secular world around us is decaying and how much it needs the salt of Jesus to, to prevent that decay and to bring back and to make it something useful? Again, salt is also a good for, it adds savor and flavor. It adds savor. I, I, I love Wisconsin cooking a lot. I, I'm really enjoying it. Um, you guys fry fish like nobody's business. But I, I think a lot of times... I need to add salt and pepper, a little bit of savor to my food because I like my food a little more robust. Robust is a great word. Thank you. It's also not insulting. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. I like my food to be a little more robust. So I find myself adding a little salt, a lot of black pepper, and probably some, 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 some hot sauce too as well. So I, I, that's how I like my food. Um, I also made the mistake of dipping cheese curds in ranch one time. I was chastised severely for that, and I will never, ever make that mistake again. But salt, is, it, 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 it influences food by adding savor and flavor. Listen to this. Salt overcomes blandness and decay. Salt overcomes blandness and decay. You and I are the salt of the world. Where we're walking in the world where there's blandness, where there is decay, we can overcome those things because we bring the presence of Jesus Christ everywhere that we go. And then light, he says, he says, you are the light of the world. Isn't it funny? In John chapter 8, he says, I am the light of the world. He says, I am the light of the world. And in Matthew, he's telling us that you are the light of the world. How many of you know that when you became a born-again Christian, that the light of the world came to make up residence in you? When the, when the light of the world came into you, you became the light of the world. It's that simple. He said, I am the light of the world. I am in you. You are in me. Now you are the light of the world. Go and be the light. Go and be salt. So, so how does light influence? Salt influences by being a preservative and, and adding flavor and, 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 and savor. Light dispels darkness. That's a real simple metaphor, right? Light dispels darkness. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And then Jesus told me through Paul that, that I am the light of the world because the light of the world is in me and my work is to dispel darkness. The metaphor is, is very plain. Darkness is, is, is the evil and the wickedness and the, and, and the brutality and the harshness that we find in secular culture. Not everything in secular culture is all those things that I just said. Some of the things in secular culture are beautiful and wonderful and nice and good to be around. Not everything in the world is bad. God created the world for it to be good and to bless us. But you and I both know that there are some aspects of our culture and our society that are decadent, that are based, and that are, they are, 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 are hurtful to other people, and they're flat out evil and wicked. Jesus said, dispel that darkness with my light. And it requires our presence. It requires our presence. I don't, I've spoke to many people here in this room and other friends that I have uh, who have really done a lot of years of, of, of ministry in the street. I'll tell a story today where we used to do street ministry. I've, I've done street ministry in Vegas when I lived out that way before. And it, it's hard. It's a tough thing to do. It's really difficult to do, but you were surprised by when you bring the light that the darkness is dispelled and you can have conversations about the love and the blessings of Jesus Christ right in the middle of the Las Vegas Strip. It's amazing how light dispels darkness. And when we go in faith, walking with that light, understanding that wherever we enter, we will dispel darkness by the power of Jesus Christ, that should give you and I a bit of boldness. 
that should give you and I a bit of courage and a bit of, a bit of, 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 of understanding the importance of our call. Where light does not go, darkness remains. Did y'all get that? Where light does not go, darkness remains. For you and I to sit around my, my, my kitchen table drinking coffee and talking about the stuff that's out there and not having a plan or the willingness or the understanding our own ability to engage that that's out there, we're just giving lip service to our faith. Yakety yakety. That's all we're just talking about it. But when you and I get motivated and get on our feet and step out of our own, I don't like to say the word comfort zone, but we step into the spaces where the darkness of, is, is at, our light will dispel the darkness, the love of Jesus will flow, and people will get saved, the kingdom of God will be growing, and we'll make, we'll make disciples. Amen. That's how it works. Amen. Did you also know that when you and I walk around in our lightedness, wherever the light already is, the light has very little influence. Now, you and I can have personal influence one to another. There are people who I've had conversations with in the past couple of weeks, and I had to be humble and come to them. And I just said, hey, I blew this. I made this mistake. I want to tell you what it is. You can hold me accountable and I, because I love you, and you're my friend, and you're my co-minister in Jesus. You need to know this. That was some light. It was dispelling darkness out of me. I'm thankful for that. But when you and I sit around in our lit circles, that's not the right word. Right? We don't say that, and that's not the right word. When you and I sit around in our state of lightedness, wherever we go and talking about being the light, we're not really making a big difference in the darkness. We need to be where the darkness is, either in prayer, with our finances, with our feet, your time and your treasures and your time. That's, that, that, that's what we need to be doing. We need to be engaging in that. Um, that's how light overcomes darkness. Look at this passage again. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. This is just a sidebar. Stepping away from the podium, which may be dangerous. If the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. We're going to talk about salt losing its flavor here in just a minute, but this is my question to you. The salt that is good for nothing, that loses its seasoning, its flavor, is trampled underfoot by men. Is it still salt? It's still salt. But it's not salt being salty anymore. Jesus said that you and I are salt. And when we lose our, our flavor, our savor, uh, when we lose our saltiness, we're not as useful to the kingdom as we could be when we're staying engaged to the one. You are the salt of the earth. How does salt lose its flavor? This is an interesting thing. It's very difficult, if not impossible, for salt to not be salt. It's always salty. The level of saltiness changes but typically, it's always salt because it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's, it's a base chemical. Um, there are things that are destructive to salt. Vinegar and bleach and acids um, are destructive to salt. And even water, to a certain extent, dilutes salt. You add, take a teaspoon of water and put it in a five-gallon jug of water, and the, the water is not going to change that much. But the salt is still there. So what makes us unsalty like vinegar and, 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 and bleach and water it's ungodly living. It's ungodly living when you and I make choices in, in, to, to live in a, life, a lifestyle that does not honor God. And I'm not casting any stones and I'm not throwing any flags. And I'm not telling you to do this or do that. I'm talking about moralism. But I am talking about the New Testament lays out simply what a Christian or a believer or a disciple of Jesus should look like. And Paul calls them liberties. Amen. Yes. And Amen. But when you and I choose purposefully to live a life that is ungodly, let me use an extreme example. It's an extreme example. This is just an example out, out, of my, out of the top of my head. I'm not talking about anybody or, or anything else in this room. With me? If you and I show up to church every Sunday morning with our brain burnt, because we spent Saturday night looking at porn, that's not godly. 
That's not liberty. That's not being salty. It makes a difference of how you live. If you, perhaps, I've been in a position, I'm going to change this very quickly, where I wasn't being as salty and as effective and impactful in, 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 in invading a secular culture, it's because I wasn't very salty. I wasn't able to make a change because I wasn't living a godly life. Been there, done that. And I'm sure many of you can testify as well. So, you guys remember, you guys remember the, the guy with the beer commercial? The real good looking guy, he'd always say, Stay thirsty, my friends. Remember that commercial? You know. <laughs> Please, somebody help me. Thank you, sister. I've always wanted to say this. Stay salty, my friends. Does that work? Is that good? Sierra, help me out. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Stay salty. Remember that, that, that you will have a negative or a positive impact wherever you go. And, and, and you, if you're not careful, you dilute your effectiveness by living an ungodly life. It will dilute almost to the point of being ineffective. But this is the good news. Have you ever noticed that you could have a, bucket, a, a, a water pot full of water and you're boiling water and, and you put the salt in it to make the water boil and the salt and it's boiling, right? And you leave the pot on and it continues to boil or you take it off and you leave it sitting on the counter and over time the water evaporates. Guess what's left? Salt. salt. The salt is still there once you remove the dilution. Once you remove the thing that's making it not salty anymore, the salt is still there and it's still salty. Uh, wherever you're at in your life and your saltiness, you can become more salty by making the decisions to live your life for God and to serve him and serve him alone. That, and I, that's so encouraging to me. It's not like, well, you know what? I used to be salty, but I made this mistake. I made this life choice. And this thing happened to me, and I don't feel very salty anymore. The salt is still in there. The salt's still there. Be faithful. Be patient. Engage with the Holy Spirit. And let that salt to be re-engaged in making a difference in culture and society. Remove the effects of ungodly living and your saltiness can be discovered. That's called grace. That's what grace is for. Listen, for salt to lose its taste is for it to lose its uniqueness. For salt to lose its flavor is for salt to use its, lose its uniqueness. Christians... Are you and I, believers, disciples of Jesus, are to be the preserving salt in a decaying world. But when you and I become too mixed up with the world and allow its values and its viewpoints to affect us, we lose our uniqueness as disciples. And our ability to make a kingdom difference is, complete, is, is directly impacted. As a disciple of Jesus, you influence and impact your world. As a disciple of Jesus, you influence and you impact your world. How many of you know that every single one of you in this room goes to different spaces than I do? You go to places that I don't go to for whatever reason. Good, bad, or indifferent, it doesn't matter. You are called and to operate in different spaces than I am. And probably the fact of the matter is that the person sitting to your left and to your right is probably in the same predicament. They are infecting different spaces than you do. We needed to pick our own saltiness and our own light into the world and, and make a difference. Um, the question is this. It's a great question, too. How can you and I influence the world, which we want to do, right? We want to be salty in the world. How can you and I influence the world and still remain uninfluenced by it? That's a great question. Because I know men and women who have went out into the world with the intention of being salt and light and become scathed and polluted and, and, and bothered with the things that happen to them in the, in the world. The, the way that you do that is your saltiness and your light, lightiness is not of you. Don't go in your own strength. Amen. Go in your own, go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in the presence and the promise and the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember when Jesus sent out the 72, two by two? He sent them out and they came back with a great report. Jesus, man, we saw people getting saved. Demons were listening to us. We had authority every place that we walked. We are awesome. <laughs> That's another sermon. And Jesus said, 
The fact that you did all those things is not that big of a deal. Because, parenthetical statement, because you did it in my power. You didn't know that. He said, but you need to be glad. You need to celebrate that, you're, that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You need to keep the right, the important things, the important things. It's all about our salvation, about our deliverance, and, and those other things as well. So, so I, I, I made up a story in my mind, and I'm Tim, because I'm terrible at metaphors. Can you imagine that somebody's job to be to remove the, 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 the gland on a skunk that makes skunk skunk, that this creates the smell? I know that people have pet skunks. If you're one of those people, God bless you big. That's really weird to me. Because I've been near skunks. They were flattened on the side of the road. Not a good experience. I stuck up on skunks in nests with their babies. Didn't get on me, but not a good experience. But imagine a man's job or a woman's job is to remove the gland that created that skunk smell. And every day, he would bring that skunk smell home to his family. Every day. It would make it, it, way, it would impact the way he had influence on his children. I, I imagine that his wife would say, you know what, do anything else. You'd stop working at the skunk place because you're bringing your stink into my house and I don't need that. <coughs> that may have been a metaphor for one of you or more of you. You may, be, you may be out in the world messing with skunks in your own strength, in your own power, and you're bringing the, the effects of your skunking into your house. You need to quit skunking. That's a new word. That's a slang where I just made that up. I know what it means, though, so that's okay. So the way that we are, can be in the world and not be influenced by the world is, is that we need to be in Jesus in the world. Christ in us, us in Christ, united together in the world. We have to be with Jesus before we do for Jesus. I'm going to say that again. I've been speaking about this, this being and doing for about two months now. We have to be with Jesus in order for us to do for Jesus. The person who goes out into the world and gets affected by the world and gets torn down by the world are trying to do for Jesus before they are being with Jesus. You and I, our primary ministry before we do anything is for us to be with Jesus. Jesus, in his word, in prayer, in worship, in fellowship, we need to be with Jesus. And when you are with Jesus, he will empower, equip you, and point you to go and do for Jesus. If you get that backwards, you're going to mess up. Well, I have gotten that backwards in my life. I have messed up because I'm trying to do for Jesus. The cross is enough. You do not have to earn your salvation. You don't have to earn the good graces of Jesus. The cross is enough. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, he meant that literally. It is done. The price is paid. My kids are protected and cared for, and i got a plan for their life. Let me get back to my notes. I didn't get this thing done because I'm having a good time, though. We have to be before we do. We have to be salt and light, and then we can influence culture. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. You can influence your culture. Your level of saltiness can be raised. Your level of lightiness, I made that word up, can be raised by being with Jesus. You can't be religious enough to be salty. You can't be religious enough to be, to be light that dispels darkness. But you can be with the one that can make you so. And his name is Jesus Christ, and he loves you madly. Then Jesus said, he said, you are the light of the world. Light has one job. Light has one job to shine. That's all light does. Light shines. When light shines, things happen. People are able to see. People have, have things are, that are, are, are cold become warm. Things that are full of germs become de decontaminated. But it all happens by light shining. He said, go. You're the light of the world. Go shine. Go shine. I, I remember. Uh, I remember when I was uh, 
uh, at, at, back in Angleton, our other church, but Tina Marie and I were active in our in our in our nursery, our ministry, our nursery ministry. And uh, like kids, there's we were with the, the, the just the pre walkers. They weren't quite walking yet. When we started there, we were with the we were with the post walkers, the three year olds. You had eight, 10, 12, 15, three year olds in the room. No, sir. Not my thing. I was not. Lord Jesus delivered me from this, and He did. He put us back into the pre walkers. So they were crawling around doing stuff. But they had the TV monitor in there. Should be healed. Stop. They had a TV monitor in there, and there was this this constant loop of, of these little kid videos. They're always fun. I wish they used more Veggie Tales because that was my jam back in the day. I love Veggie Tales. They were great. But there was one particular uh, there's one particular uh, cartoon. It was a cartoon that came on. It was uh, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. It was done to kind of a, a real up-tempered jazz, uh, kind of a hip hop uh, hip tune. And it was just a light bulb. And it had legs. It had arms. The bottom part was down here. Whoops. And the top part was where the screw went. And he would just walk around like this. And he just shined wherever he went. The shine. He just shone wherever he went. This is going on the video, too. That's kind of cool. Uh, my friends are going to bust me up over that. That the light would just shine. And wherever this light bulb walked, and, and confident, he was walking confidently, it shone, and the darkness was dispelled. I think about that light bulb, that's the picture that's in my mind when I think about God telling us that we're the light of the world, and that we're to shine, have influence over darkness, so much so that wherever light is, darkness cannot be. The world is a dark place that requires illumination, and Jesus is the light of the world, and he expects us to be light as well. He also said this, he said, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Y'all flown air, in airplanes before? You ever flown at night? And you're looking down, it's clear sky, and you're looking down, and you see these pockets of, of light all over the place. And, and, and but I remember one time I was flying, and we were able to use the internet on, our, on the plane we were on, so I got on the internet, and I to pin my location so I could figure out where I was. And it's amazing, like, over here is Austin, and over here is Dallas, and up there is Oklahoma City. You're 35,000 feet up in the air. You can see all these little, small pockets of light that are actually huge, huge uh, cities. In the same way, when a city is placed up on a hill, you ever been to Colorado where the mountains are at? It's the mountains of Wisconsin. I've heard it, and you go see them, I think. But you see the little, little villages up on top of the mountains from way down in the valley. You, that cities cannot be hid because of the light that it's expelling into the darkness. Well, you and I are the same way. We're, we're, we're the city on the hill. We cannot be hid when we're expelling lights. But if there was a, a bad thunderstorm that came through like last night or, or last week and we lose electricity for a little while, you can't see the light in the dark because it's not dispelling anything. It doesn't change anything. Um, Jesus said, no one lights a lamp to hide it under a basket. No one lights a lamp to put it where nobody can see it. Nobody lights a lamp and puts it in a drawer where it does no good to nobody. Terrible grammar. Jesus did not call you to be light for you to live under a basket. Jesus did not call me to, to be the light of the world for me to live inside of a cabinet where no one can see my light. Your faith is not a private matter. Your faith is not a private matter. My faith is a personal faith. I don't, don't talk about my faith because it's my personal faith. Well, then it's your faith in your person, but it's not your faith in Jesus Christ, right? Your faith is not, is not a private matter. We're called, we're equipped, we're engaged, we're in, to shine so people can see our good works and give the glory to the Father in heaven. To, to, to hide a light is contradictory to its purpose. For God to make us a light and we put ourselves in our own private faith walk, it's contradictory to being a light. Friends, you and I need to get our light on. We need to get our light on. We need to get our light on and take it out and dispel the darkness every place that we go. In his power and in his strength and for his glory. We must shine so people see our good works and give the glory to the Father in heaven. Listen, non-Christians... Non-disciples, people that you know who don't love Jesus, can still good, do good things. They're, they're, they're not, they can still do good things for other people. We don't have a corner on that market. We have a corner on the power and the source of that market, amen. But people who are not believers can do good things. I'm, I'm glad to know that because, again, if you walk around thinking, well, you can't do any good. You don't love Jesus. 
Well, way to go, Mr. Pharisee. Here's another rock for you, buddy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I've been that guy, and I've been set free of that spirit, and I'm grateful for that. So if, if, if the non-Christians, non-disciples are able to do good works, so what does Jesus mean when he tells us to do good works? Double click. Okay. Did I turn it off? No, that's on. Oh, for his, thank you. For we are his workmanship. This is Ephesians 2. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I don't want to get too far way off into this passage. I'll be here for a while. Yeah, but we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We are his workmanship created to be salt and created to be light, to do good works. So good works is part of what we've been created to do. It is something we do to and for another in which God gets the glory. That's the difference when a person who is not serving Jesus does good works. He does it for his own glory, and that's fine. It's not worth a whole lot in this grand scheme of things. But when you and I do good works, we serve our neighbors and love our neighbors well. When we walk around and we're being salt and light, we can give God the glory, and that serves God very well, and that pleases our Father. Bob, if you would come. Uh, and, 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 and the girls too. So, so listen, Jesus was salty. He was salty. And Jesus was lighty. And he showed his disciples, that's you and I, by the way, what godly salt looks like. Jesus went about in the power of the Holy Spirit, healing and delivering all influenced by the devil's power. That's Acts chapter 10. And likewise, his disciples learned to devote themselves to doing good work. Look at them. See how they love. Turn the other cheek. Take it the extra mile. See how they love. Disciples, they learn to devote themselves to doing good work, showing deeds of kindness and helping those in need. And they became eager to do those good works. That's Titus chapter 2. And in doing so, they made the teachings about Jesus attractive. Talk to me about your Jesus. That's great. Show me how he loves. That's better. That works better all day long. Followers of Christ are in the world, but not of the world. We are citizens of another kingdom, God's kingdom. And they are, they are blessed and a blessing, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Play something pretty before we worship, Bob. We're going to worship just a little more, just a little bit. So, listen. The world needs more salt. The world needs more saltiness, and the world needs more light. Manasseh needs more salt and more light. The Fox Valley needs more salt and more light. Jesus said that you and I are the salt, and you and I are the light. And it were to go and dispel darkness and bring health and life back to decaying societies and cultures by the spaces that we go. How's your salt? How's your light? Are you salty as you need to be? Are things happening where salt is not salty anymore? Is something happening in your life where light is being put up in a basket and there's no more light coming out? Do you need a little help? Listen, if you're that guy, you come. You come and, and we're going to pray together. Perhaps you come to these altars and, and pray that Crossroads as a church family is more salt and more light as, as we love our neighbors. Or maybe you'd like to become a follower of Jesus. Maybe you realize that, that maybe you don't have the saltiness and the light that he said that we have. Today's your day to come and become born again. Or maybe you just like to just come and pray. Listen, the light of the world has placed the light in you. And he's called us, you and I, to be light and you and I to be salt. So as he leads you right now in this space, let's all stand together. And, and you come. Let's worship.